Welcome back to Just Campers and welcome back to Lewis's Beetle, episode three. So Lewis has been away for the weekend enjoying the drive of his car. Uh, you done some miles, Lewis? Yes, I don't know how many though. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Because I might on my chair, doesn't I? Oh, of course, you did mention that, yes. <laughs> I, I didn't have time to look at that last time. So we don't, <laughs> we don't know how many miles you've been clocking up. Uh, and you've got a bit of a list from your drive, things that are not working or... Yeah, that's right. Stuff you've yeah. noticed. So what, what we got, let's run down the list and see, see where we're at. Okay, so there's a bit of a electrical issue with the radio going on and off randomly. Is there? Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, I need to look <coughs> at that then. So what do you mean it goes on and off randomly? Uh, you turn it on. Turn the headlights on and the radio goes off. That's... Novel. Yeah. Oh, okay. It sounds like a bit of an earth problem then. Okay. Right, so radio issue, fair enough. Next, what, what else we got? Uh, Obviously the mileometer. Mileometer. We need to look at it. So the speedo works, because we were yes. interested in speed when we drove it, doing the test drive. But it doesn't clock up any miles. No. It just stays. <laughs> okay. So we need to look at that. Uh, otherwise, well, I suppose it's quite good for uh, keeping the mileage down side of it. But, <laughs> uh, yeah, no worries. Next. Uh, washers. So the washers, I think, are actually on a, a separate switch under the dash, because they should be in the little um, wiper switch. Next. Uh, the gauges are all a bit iffy. They're all a bit wiggly, aren't they? Clock. Well, we know about the oil pressure gauge. Uh, we need to get another sender unit. And I think what I'll do is check the gauges out, check the earths, because it sounds like we may have some bad earths around the back of the dash, then if the radio is doing that weird thing with the headlight switch. Um, okay. So we can look into that at the same time, no problem. Okay, excellent. It'd be nice to have a bit more padding on the seat. Oh, really? Uh, feel the springs. <laughs> <laughs> Again, these are only things you notice after sitting in it for a while. Yeah. Yeah, because sort of just moving it in and out of the workshop, well, it's standard. But obviously, you sat in it for a period, quite a period of time over the yeah, weekend doing, get a doing bit your. Of a sore there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Okay. Oh, well, we can take a look at that. That's not a problem. I think um, we might have to put a new um, horsehair padding in because they wear through and then you can feel the springs in your legs. Okay. Which is probably where we're at. Okay, yeah. that's cool. Uh, and then yeah, just the gear shift would be nice if it was a bit more... Oh, that's fluid. still quite stiff, isn't it? Yeah. But the gearbox is good. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Yes. <laughs> so that's a win. Um, so I need to look at that linkage. As I said before, it may just be the linkage. It may be uh, the, the linkage is slightly out of line at the rear because it did have that strange polyurethane mount on the front of the gearbox. Don't like them so much. Yeah. So we could put an original mount back on and see if that lines up and see if that slackens up our um, shift linkage. If not, we can pull that apart and have a look. That's no worries at all. So okay. you got some stories and tales to tell from the weekend or was it most enjoyable? Yeah. <laughs> it's all good. It's a uh, nice drive, yeah. Excellent, yeah. excellent. And do I need to check underneath? <laughs> I guess. Yeah. <laughs> what should I say? I think there's something he's not telling me. <laughs> I know I've heard a little conversation about him. Uh, grind, uh, did you manage to sort of, <clears throat> what, grind the bottom out or something, was it? Yeah, a bit of a bump in the road. Ah, okay, so. okay. So, <laughs> something I need to check out with when I get it back on the ramp then. Other than that, all good though. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. Right, well, anything else, Lewis? Oh, yeah, I could do a like, wash as well. Oh, right. <laughs> uh, I'll get my bucket of sponge then, shall I? <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, no worries, Lewis. All right, we, we'll get on that ramp and uh, get cracking then. That's it. Okay. Excellent. I'll let you get back to what are you doing, drinking tea now? Yeah. Right, I'll let you get to do that. Uh, I'll get my bucket of sponge. Okay. Really glad Lewis enjoyed his drive and, and had a good weekend out in the car. And it's good that he's come back with some feedback for me, obviously that he's noticed during his drive, such as the radio. That sounds a bit weird, doesn't it? He said he put the headlights on and the radio went out. So it all sounds a little bit bad earthy to me. Uh, plus the dash gauges are, are quite sort of, um, not very stable actually. They do sort of fly about all over the place. So we're gonna start there and obviously take a look at the mileometer because he doesn't know how many miles he's done yet. And then once we've done all that, then we can get back on with the good old mechanical bits. So the best place to start for our electrics, I think, is probably behind the dash. Take a little peeky, see what we've got and go from there. Right, so we can get to the, oh my word. Uh, look at that lot, Nick. That is a lot of wiring. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I've got my work cut out here, I think. I'm gonna to have to go through and see what's what. I think a lot of this is radio wiring, actually. Which, look at that lot. Surely we don't need all that. 
I think I'm going to have to start on the radio um, purely because of I'm sure we don't need all those plugs and all that wiring. Uh, so we can get rid of some of that, simplify it. It's got a little amp here as well. And I'm going to run through all the feeds and make sure the earths are good. And also go to the fuse box, check the back side of it, but check where the actual fuses fit. Um, very easy to get bad connections there. So we'll have a look at that also. So I've put the wipers on just to see if they work, which they do. But they also move the radio. You can actually see part of the wiper mech is coming around and swiping the top of the radio. That is no good, so we need to sort that out. Um, yes, another thing to check. As you can see, I've tidied it up a bit. I've managed to tidy up our radio wiring and get rid of the unwanted plugs that we didn't need. Obviously, I also made a really nice uh, earth for our radio feed. And the problem we had, though, was I traced the feed back to the fuse box. And the fuse box um, is going to need replacing. The reason why is it's the same age as the car. The contacts on the back of the fuse box aren't that good. They're not heavily corroded, but they're quite dirty and old and tarnished. And inside, I'll show you what's happened. So the, the two contacts, top and bottom, that actually hold the fuse in place and transmit our, our current from one side to the other, uh, they've lost their tension, so they're actually quite loose. <laughs> so unfortunately, it, it doesn't allow a good contact to our fuse. And when we put the lights on and draw a lot of current through, we have a bad connection, which causes a lot of heat, hence, the melted fuse. So the only way to rectify that is to remove the fuse box and put a nice new one in. This is our lovely new fuse box. And as you can see, I've popped a fuse in this end here and we've got some lovely tension due to this springiness of the contacts. So the old one is really soft and the new one's really firm. So it keeps a good connection across that fuse at all times. So before I move, remove any wires and the old fuse box, first thing I need to do is shut the battery off. Luckily, we've got a battery cut off, so that's really easy. Time to swap those fuse boxes out. That's the new fuse box fitted. So hopefully that'll keep our headlights on and most importantly for Lewis, uh, keep his radio going. Uh, I know it all looks a little bit, yeah, messy, but it all works. The connections are all good, which was my main concern. Um, we will address this at some point, but I think the only way to address this is to take it all out and unfortunately start again. Uh, it looks a bit of a rat's nest, but as I said, connections are good. Um, yeah, I think that's a job for another day. We've got everything working. So now here we are underneath the um, driver's panel. Look at that, brand new fuse box, brand new fuses, really good connections. And these are nice and tight, whereas the original fuse boxes, they've gone quite loose and the bad connections were just one after the other. So that will keep him on the road. Our next little issue to take a look at for Lewis was his complaint about the stiff gears. So I think he really enjoyed the drive, apart from, I think he said he's got used to it now, so he's built up one arm muscle this side. But in all seriousness, we do need to take a look at it because it is really stiff. So that's our next thing. First thing we need to do is remove our gear stick and that's held in by two bolts. So we remove the gear stick assembly. This one's a, an MP um, modified slightly. I think it's got a shorter throw as well. And also, don't forget to remove the shift plate and keep that in the same orientation you took it out. Don't turn it over or change it around because it'd be a bit of a nightmare when you come to refit it. So that's that bit. Next, we need to remove the coupling at the gearbox end. First thing, obviously, to get access, remove the rear seat, which is quite easy. Just pick it up and get them out of there. Then this plate comes out. There's a screw that locks in at the front. Once that screw removes, we can then wiggle them out free. And then we're left with our coupling. Uh, and our coupling's got a square drive here. It's normally got um, like a locking wire through, so we snip the locking wire through, off, and then unwind it. So it's got a pointy end to locate into the uh, gearbox shift rod side of it. And once we've done that, we can then withdraw it off of the gearbox, and that brings the shift rod forward. And then we do need to remove this from our shift rod. The way we do that is by undoing this eight mil bolt head this side and holding this receptacle still that side. And what that does is allow us to take that out, take this out, and then that our shift rod can then move forward. We can take this out completely. So here we are, let's get it moving. So we can just now slide this forward. Actually, if we just spin it off to one side, we can now slide it through the bush. The bush we're gonna be replacing is just under here. So we need to slide this rod right out of the car. Um, so I'm gonna use a pair of pliers and walk this forward. 
So to actually remove that shift rod right out of the car so we can replace the bush, we need to remove three little panels. So there's one in the very front here. As you can see, it's the one that I've taken out. The next one is here on the inside. And again, that's held in by one screw and a little lug. So we one screw out and we take that out. Next, there's a panel that's actually bolted to the floor pan with two 10 mil headed bolts. And that's up underneath and on the front of the frame. So the two bolts are undone and then we can just remove this panel, get them out of the way, and there we go, there's the hole. So that's the shift rod out of the car. It doesn't have to come all the way out. And you can take it all the way out and put it on the bench if you wish, but as long as the back end of the shift rod has dropped out of the bush, and now we just need to replace the bush. So now it's time to try and remove that old bush. It's situated in the tunnel, pretty much directly underneath that bolt hole where we've removed the gear stick. Um, the only way I can get it out is probably with a pair of long nose pliers and a torch so I can see where it is. So wish me luck and see if I can get it out. Pick it out, there it comes. It's a baby boy. Yuck. So here's the lovely new one and here's the old one that's got all soft and weird and this edge had actually folded itself over uh, and stopping the shift rod actually moving smoothly through it. So hopefully with our nice new one fitted, will it be gliding super smooth? And you can see the new bush in position. I've got Lewis's shift rod actually out at the moment because I was putting it back and I noticed there was quite a kink in the actual shift rod itself right the way through. So I've taken the whole thing out and I've finished straightening it in the uh, jaws of the vise here as it should be straight, but this was quite kinked. So I think that was giving us our sticky uh, gear lever changing due to the actual bend and the, the force being pushed down on the bush. And that might be why the bush is so out of shape. Blech. So we've got a lovely straight gear shift rod now that we can put back into the car and see if we can get that lovely slick gear change. So the easiest way to pop the shift rod back into the car is I'm gonna use my torch, pop in through the gear stick hole. So that illuminates the tunnel and I can see where the bush is. And when I'm at the front of the vehicle, I can then push our shift rod through and get it lined up. So let's lift him up. I need to get my hand down there and get the end of the shift rod and pull it up through, so, which I've got just here, perfect. And it should just come through our bush at the front, which it is doing, and it should appear. There we are. Right, next, we're gonna put a brand new coupler. So the coupling that goes between our shift rod and the actual shift rod in the gearbox. It's one of these, this is the original one. Uh, it's in fairly good condition, but it's quite soft. The bushes have gone a bit soft and it's old. So we're gonna put a nice brand new one on, which is this one here. These are actually polyurethane style now. So a lot firmer, should give us a really positive engagement. So it's quite easy to fit. It's got one main bolt that goes all the way through the coupler and the actual shaft itself. And then it's locked in with a bolt that goes in this side. Let's just nip that up. Now it's time to pop the gear stick in and see what we've got. So we've bolted in. Um, I just roughly gauged where to bolt it in. Pretty central. So our sort of first to second is really good. Third to fourth is really good. But then when you come back to go back into first, we've got the stop plate underneath. And the idea of the stop plate is that you can move the gear stick across, hit the stop plate and then go forward into first. At the moment, we've got a bit of play between first and the stop plate. So if I come all the way over, it won't go into first. I have to centralize it and go in. So I do need to adjust it slightly. So I'm gonna loosen off the two bolts, move the stop plate over slightly, tighten it back down, and just make sure that when we bring that gear stick over to touch the top stop plate, we can then just pop it straight into first. So it's worth spending a few minutes and just correcting that uh, adjustment. Now I can push the gear stick across so it touches the stop plate. And once it's across, I can go straight forward into first, back into seconds, exactly what we wanted. Obviously third and fourth. And the lovely thing, again, across to the stop plate, and then press this button here, which then puts this into reverse. That feels really good. So much better than it was. I think Lewis would be super happy with that. That's really positive. Yeah, perfect. Worth spending the time. Well, I've got Lewis down here because I want him to try out his new gear stick and, uh, well, give it a go, Lewis. See what you think. First time from when it was horrible. Oh, yeah. What do you reckon of that? Lovely. <laughs> That's much better, isn't it? It's like yeah. Super silky. And the uh, stop gate's in the right position so you yeah. can come over and go into first, all right? Can't get into, can't accidentally go into the reverse. No. 
Spot on. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, so, man, good, right. So I think while Lewis is here, we're going to check out this fuel gauge situation. So it's either the sender unit's incorrect or the gauge itself may not be working correctly. So while we're here, I think I'm going to get you to help me. You can keep an eye on the gauge. I'm going to earth the gauge uh, sender wire out and we're going to make sure that that gauge does a full sweep up to full and back down to zero. And if that does, then that bit's working fine then it means it's the sender unit and then that's a, another job. So let's uh, do that first. So if you whack the ignition on for me, don't start it, don't run me over, just the lights on. <laughs> there you go. All good? And what I'll do is take off our sender wire here and then I'm going to short that out, so take that directly to earth. And then Lewis should be able to tell me if the gauge is going all the way up to the top. Is it still going? Still going up, yeah. Good, good, good. Uh, yeah, it's pretty much stopped there. So it's about just over a quarter or to go. Oh, it hasn't, hasn't gone all the way up to full? No. Has it not? No. Oh. Okay, so that could either mean we've got a bad earth here or that our gauge doesn't go all the way up to full. <laughs> that hasn't gone up to full? No, so yeah, about a quarter, quarter Three away. quarters? Just over three quarters. Just over three quarters, so between three quarters and full? Yeah. Okay, so that is the maximum that that gauge moves. Okay. Uh, so if I take it off, it obviously goes all the way back to zero. It's uh, right on the white. No, right right on, on the, the white, on the so that side. is empty on the white. Yeah. Okay. okay. So we do need to adjust this sender unit or put another sender unit in. Even though the gauge doesn't go right the way up to full, um, we're getting sort of, would you say, beyond three quarters, but between the three quarters and full. Tiny, yeah. I mean, that may yeah. just be because the gauge is old and it's never going to read full. But more importantly, obviously, we need it to read the correct empty. Oh, my God, look, the tank is full up. What was it reading? When it turned it on, it wasn't full, was it? No. This gauge doesn't seem to be doing what it should do at all, does it? That's that part of the testing finish. So thank you, Lewis. You can go and do your IT wizardry or whatever he does. Cheers, Lewis. See you later. He's off. Next thing I need to do is just test the resistance of this sender unit. Make sure that's in spec. Uh, although we were trying to get the gauge to move, obviously the gauge is not moving correctly. So I just want to double check. Obviously the gauge wasn't moving correctly. So I just want to make sure this is good. We can check this with an ohms meter quite easily. It should go between 80 and 10 ohms, roughly somewhere around there. So if we've got a nice smooth full sweep between that, those two figures, this is good. Uh, and we would need to sort of look at the dash end in a little bit more detail. But let's just double check this. We've got our sender unit on the bench. So now I can measure the resistance of it. I'm gonna use my multimeter to measure the resistance and have the setting to ohms. Uh, hopefully we're gonna see somewhere between 80 to 10 ohms. 80 on empty and 10 on full, hopefully. Let's try it. So empty, it reads 80, yeah, 81 ohms, that's close enough. And then we should get a nice smooth sweep all the way through to full, which should go down to roughly anywhere between 10, 10, amp, uh, 10 ohms, which we are, well, yeah, roughly seven ohms, 10 ohms. So, so I would say, uh, say it probably wouldn't go that far. We'll go to 10. I'm happy with that, that's doing the right sweep. Uh, so further investigation needed. We need to look at the gauge end now. The last thing I need to do is just double check our voltage regulator that's actually on the back of the fuel gauge. So it delivers the fuel gauge a voltage of 5.2 volts or thereabouts. We'll make sure we've got that. If we have, I'm gonna to have to take the gauge out. 5.2, perfect. So we've got the correct voltage at the gauge. So that means I need to take the gauge out and take a look why the gauge is sticking. Uh, as you can tell, <laughs> it's a little bit more fun, should I say, uh, because of like the previous wiring that's been done on this car. As you can see, it's not very neat. It's had a lot of wires added. Um, so I'm trying to really carefully remove that gauge without disturbing the extra wires that have been put in. And obviously, I need to make sure everything works when it goes back together. But this is why it's a really good idea to try and keep your wiring as neat as possible have the fuel gauge removed from the speedo head itself, complete with its uh, voltage stabilizer. I'm gonna pop a 12 volt supply on this side. That will give us a five volt supply to our gauge. And then what we can do is put an earth on this side and see if we get a full sweep. Now it's out of the um, speedo head. Let's see if that does it. So pop the old 
12 volts on there. And then the earth wire can go on here. As you can see, it's going up. Is it going to go all the way? No, then it sort of gets stuck there, which is sort of three quarters really, isn't it? Not quite full. Okay. I think I just need a tiny bit of adjustment. What I'm going to do is adjust the tension of the spring, which pushes against the needle itself, just to see if that will allow it to go to full sweep uh, and then come back to full zero as well. So let's try that first. Put a little bit of tension off of that spring there. With the pliers, very delicate, there we go. Let's try it, let's pop that on. See if we get a nice full reading now. Would you look at that? Nearly there, hey? Perfect. Okay, so we get a full reading. So it's just a little bit too much tension on that spring. Uh, that's cool, I'm pleased with that. So we can pop that back together and get that back in the dashboard. So that's our speedo finished and back in. Last thing I want to do today is the valve clearances as we haven't checked those and they should be checked every 3000 miles. So I don't know when it was last done, but let's get that bit done. Uh, and then that's probably it for the day. Right, first thing to do is get both rocker covers off and then we can have a look. Always a good idea to have a drip dry underneath as well because we don't know how much oil is going to fall out. Hopefully not too much. Look at that, pretty dry. Pretty good. A little bit of oil in there. Nothing to worry about. They look clean actually as well, which is good. All right, good. That side's clean too. So before I can start measuring our valve clearances, first thing I need to do is get it to TZ, TDC on number one. Uh, this little red mark here denotes TDC. And if we lift the distributor cap, I've got the rotor arm pointing at number one spark plug lead. So now we're good to go. I can check the clearances on number one and then we can go from there. I've got my feeler blade here and I've got a six valve feeler blade, which is 0.15 of a millimeter. And I'm gonna check the clearance between the valve and the rocker assembly and make sure that this fits through nice and snug. So that feels like we've got quite a nice bit of resistance on that feeler blade. So that gap is correct. Inlet is much the same. These are good. So these have been done fairly recently, I think, but definitely worth checking. Okay, so that's number one, I'm happy with that. Now we're gonna back our engine round anti-clockwise, 180 degrees, and then I can check number two. I'll show you. So now I'm gonna rotate the engine anti-clockwise. So this mark would be at the bottom, 180 degrees down there. And then we should be pointing at number two uh, on the distributor. And then I can adjust or check the valve clearances on the inlet and the exhaust on number two. So let's go back this way. You can take the spark plugs out, which make it a bit easier. Obviously, I've left them in, <laughs> make it more difficult for myself. And there we go. Yeah, so I can feel that our TDC mark is 180 degrees around from the top. And there's even a little paint mark here for 180 degrees. So that's a good sign. Looks like it has been done. All you need to adjust your valve clearances is a 13 mil spanner. This one's like got a nice cranked angle on it, so it gives it a little bit more clearance when we're undoing the lock nut a screwdriver to actually adjust the clearance and obviously your measuring device. So this is our feeler blade. I've got the correct size on this end and then I've got a size either side of that. So one smaller, one bigger. Actually, that one's a little bit loose so we can adjust him up a touch. And actually that one's a little bit loose as well. So number four is a touch loose. We we'll just adjust those. If these are like our ones to check that we can't get them through. I'll show you. So I'm gonna adjust Exhaust one first. As I said, that was quite sloppy, so it needs just to touch up. We're gonna give it a little tinksy, wincy, tiny turn. And try and leave that in the same position. Crank it around and just go like an eighth, less than an eighth, actually like a sixteenth. Give that a nip and see where we're at. That may be too much, but let's check. So there's my sixth thou, my 1.5. Okay, so we can go a little bit more. Let's check, just check how big it is. So we've got seven thou, will seven thou go through it? Oh, just about, so we're close. So I know that it's getting tight on our seven thou. So we've got a little way to go to get it six. So just another minute turn on that adjuster. And we should be good. And as you do the lock nut up, that sometimes can uh, make the difference in the, in the clearance as well. 
So that's why I try and do it with the lock nut jammed still and move, move the center adjuster. Because if you back the lock nut right off and get it correct with the adjuster in the center, by the time you do the lock nut, it changes. So, okay, so that's a bit tight now. Will we get a five through it? No, so I've gone a little bit too far. So we just need to back off half the amount of which I put on, if that makes sense. There we go, spot on, absolutely spot on. It's got a nice resistance drag across the feeler blade and we're all done. So thanks for tuning into episode three. I feel like we got a few things done off of uh, Lewis's list. So a good step forward. Next time, I'm gonna take a little look under the underside and I really wanna have to take a look at those heat exchangers, make sure that the heating's working great as winter's coming up. So please join us in episode four. Thanks for watching, make sure you subscribe and we'll see you next time.